So I'm asking myself how well am I loving others, how well am I show, showing hospitality. Uh, the next thing, uh, number, number three, remember those who are in prison as those, who are, uh, as those in prison with them, those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Really quick, I'm, I'm asking myself the question, how well am I remembering those who suffer? How, how well am I remembering those who suffer? And in, 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 this, in the context here, especially in remembering, it's, it's a constant remembrance. It's something that's on your mind all the time where you're, where you're really thinking about them. Where you're really praying for them. Where even in the context here, I mean, individuals in prison in this day and age, they, they, they didn't get Food. They didn't have uh, subsidies where they were taken care of in the prison system. They, they were, it, was, uh, it was relied upon others to take care of them while they were in prison. And, and so the writer of Hebrews is saying, remember them, don't forget them. And, 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 and remember them as if you are in prison with them. Rem- remember them as a fellow sufferer, basically that you are, as if you yourself were suffering. How, how quick, how quick are you to respond to someone who's suffering. I don't suggest that it has to be uh, the same response every single time. I mean, sometimes I'll do it. I mean, some, there, like recently, there was a little bit more of a drastic response. I, I had a friend who was, honestly, he was suffering, and uh, he was going through something extremely difficult, and, and I, I, was, I was really worried about him. And, I, and, 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 and I, I, it was to the point where I, I was so concerned for him and, and what he was w- walking through and, and where this may lead that I literally went to my computer. I brought a plane ticket, and I hopped on a plane uh, um, Two days later, and I went and saw him. I said, hey, man, I just, I just want to check on you. I want to check on you face to face. You need anything? Sometimes it's as simple as a phone call or a text or, or, or pulling them aside and say, hey, can I, I'm just going to put my arm around you. Can I, can I just pray for you? So some, sometimes it requires a, a drastic response. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes, sometimes it requires a response where, where, you, where you just in that moment you, you, you are interceding with them and for them. And, and, and so I encourage you, you know, ask yourself the question, how, how well are you relating to those who are suffering? You know, again, think about that drastic illustration. There's, there's people in our faith family that are aware of situations that, honestly, are just constantly. It's just, uh, there's, there, there's a, a little bit of weight there, not a little bit, a lot of weight that, uh, that I know that they're facing. I don't have a clue all the details of what they're going through emotionally, but uh, they're constantly on my mind. So when, they're, when, when the Spirit constantly draws someone to your mind, I encourage you to, to stop, and, stop and pray for them and, and intercede with them. There, there are individuals who, uh, who used to be a part of our faith family that I'm, I'm aware of. They're going through a very challenging time with their, their, their son. And it's just, there's, a, there's a level of uh, 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 persecution execution there that it's just uh, it's just warfare and, and so they're constantly on my mind I, I i want you to feel that weight and when you feel that weight feel that weight with your with your friends and your fellow believers and and, and just don't just don't feel the weight but respond and act I mean, there is a, uh, in a lot of ways at, at, at NAM, uh, North American Mission, where we talk about call to actions all the time. What's, what's the call to action? Well, in each one of these, there should be one of these, these elements of what, what's the call to action? How am I going to respond? Uh, how, how are you going to respond to those who are suffering? And, and here, here's, where, here, here's where it's just, you just have to have wisdom. I mean, some people have a physical need right then that you have to meet. And I uh, read that passage earlier where I mean, what, what good is it if you, you, if you know a brother's in need and you don't do anything about it? You've you, you got to respond. You've got to act on, on these things. These, are, the, the, these, these questions that I'm asking, these are, these are ways that you and I can practically work out day in and day out our faith. What else? Verse 4. Let the marriage, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. How well am I protecting? And I'm going to flush this out for you here, so you so you understand where I'm going. 
How well am I protecting the illustration of Christ's love for his church? We live, I mean, since the 60s and 70s, the sexual revolution is continuing to continue to build and build and build. And, 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 and there are things that, uh, that are done and said now that were not done and said in, in, in years past. And there's this whole uh, uh, picture of experimenting that, 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 that's taking place. And, and, and what, what God is saying here is that you, you've got to protect the original purpose of marriage, the original intent there. I, I think about, I, I think, of, and here's why. Here's why. I believe Paul answers that for us in Ephesians 5. If you're not familiar with, with, with the book of Ephesians, Paul is basically, in his last three chapters, he's, he's saying, here's how you should live. And he's, he's looking at husbands and wives and, and honestly putting, a, uh, putting, putting a, a, tremendous, a tremendous amount of pressure on the husband. And so when you, when you get to Ephesians 5, it, it says, Husbands, in verse 25, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he may present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and blameless or without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body, he who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just, cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. It goes on in verse 32. It says, this is a profound mystery. I am saying, and I am saying that it is referring to Christ and the church. And so when you see, when you see the marital relationship failing in our society. When you see experimentation that is outside of God's bounds, when you see, when you see or hear a revolution, a sexual revolution that is contrary to the original intent of God, the warfare, the warfare element of it is that it is destroying the very picture that God put into place to reference His love for His church. Does that make sense? Don't miss that. Sometimes we, we, we go after, and, and, and I would tell you, uh, it, it's okay to be angry, but let your hearts break as well, because the spiritual warfare element of, that's taking place is that Satan is destroying a portrait of what God intended to be his love for this church. That's why he puts so much weight here on the husband. So you got to get this right. Because your relationship with your spouse or with your future spouse is going to be the very thing that I use on this earth to reflect my love for my people. Don't write that off as if it does not matter. I know that it is hard to hold your ground here right now in this context in our society. I beg you, as you're exercising faith in the one who has authority over all things, I beg you, to consider the ramifications if we, if, if we give way here. God, God put marriage in place for a purpose. Don't forget that. Yes, it's about family and it's about building families. But at the end of the day, Paul says it's a mystery. It's profound and I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. So how well are you holding? How, gosh, there's, I'm running out of time here. Gentlemen, though, uh, I would tell you because this, this passage is, is not only in Ephesians, but also um, uh, if you tie this back to Matthew 5, 
uh, I, I, would, I would tell you, you, you fight your flesh. You fight your flesh. Your flesh wants to deceive you. Your flesh wants to, to, to cause you to sin in this area. And, and I, I would say that if you have, there is grace and there is forgiveness. And I love that passage in, in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. If you, if you failed in that area, there is grace and there is forgiveness. I love his grace. I love his forgiveness. But I would tell you, fight that fight because it is worth it for the sake of the kingdom. All right. One last thing. Aren't you glad I cut, cut it down from 10 to 5? <laughs> I love this word. I really, I really do. I, 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 there, there's, there's things here that I just, gosh, I just wish, wish I could keep sharing with you. But I won't. I'll respect your time. And I, I know that you'll, I just encourage you to keep reading forward here. Uh, uh, keep seeking, because there, there's so many more imperatives in this passage. Verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Question number five. And I really, it's a good place to land because I really need you to not just hear this and walk out and let it go in one ear and out the other. Because there is a, there's a depth here of what the writer of Hebrews and others that I'm going to get to that, that are writing here. It is, it is critical for your soul. Hear me say that. This right here is critical for your soul. And so the question is, for me, am I, am I content with what I have? Am I content? Am I content with what's, what I have around me? And I, and, and I will tell you that there, there are struggles. This is not, I, will, I promise you, the more that I learn this, and some of you are much older than me and much wiser than me, you will stand here and tell me that it's a fight that you have to fight constantly. Because we live in a society that uh, it's, it's about more, 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 more. We, we, want, we want more. We, we want to do more. We want to spend more money. We want to do more. And I might, I'm, listen, I am not, I'm not saying anything negative about possessions because possessions, um, uh, we, we, we're going to have possessions. But, but, but at the same time, there, there, there is a weight of this passage and others that I'm about to read that, that we have to weigh in what we do with our possessions. And, 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 and again, are we finding contentment in our possessions? I mean, re very recently. I mean, this, was, this is something that was very real that I just really had to wrestle with. I, I had an opportunity uh, to, to purchase uh, the house next door to the place we're renting right now. And it's a, it's a great home. We love living in this neighborhood. We love being close to the church. We, it's convenient to Mindy's work. And, 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 and we love the house. We love our street. We, we, we love loved everything about it. And, and, and you know, there, was, there, were, there were things about, it, about the, you know, the kitchen. I love the kitchen. Because you know what I, I, what, I, what I saw in that kitchen? I knew that I could get all of, all of those dishes that are in storage right now. I could get them out. I had storage room for those dishes. And you know what getting those out meant? Mindy would do more cooking. <laughs> and I, was, I saw it and I was like, oh, she's going to she love this kitchen. She's going to love this kitchen because I'm going to love this kitchen and what the results that come out of it. And don't get me wrong, my wife is an excellent cook and, 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 and she, she, like, she cooks now in excellent ways. But again, Hear the illustration, because every illustration breaks down at some point. But hear the illustration. I really had to, had to wrestle with this, because you, you and I both know that homes in this area, they are not cheap. Uh, they, 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 I mean, 
when I think about the price tag on that home and I started going back, I was like, do you have any farms I could purchase with that? I could buy my dad out in, in our tree farm for that amount. And, and I, and I was wrestled with it and wrestled with it and wrestled with it. And I was praying about it. And, the, and, I, and I, had a, I had a friend, one friend, a couple of friends actually in particular, they were praying with me on this. And how, how do I lead my family in this? And I just heard the Lord again. I'm, I'm, again, I'm teaching you where, where the Lord is teaching me. Uh, and, and again, this is part of my personal study I'm sharing with you. And um, um, the Lord just spoke so clearly. And just, it was almost as he put his arm around me and said, Jason, are you content? Are you content? I knew, I knew at that point, I knew what the answer was. Oh, I was still running numbers and spreadsheets, and, but the, really at the heart level, I, I, I knew. I, I knew that the Lord was saying, Jason, just, just be content. I provided the place you're in right now, and yeah, you're renting yeah, I know it's hard for you. You're having to pay more in taxes and not probably saving the, the, uh, the equity that you'd like to be having right now. But just, just really, Jason, are, are, you, are you content? You know, so honestly, I, I will tell you. In that moment, the, the, the bricks that came off my shoulder, that I, I mean, I was really stressing out over this. I, I, I really wanted to know, God, what, what, what should I do? I mean, if you're going to be God of my finances, what, what, do I, what, do I, what do I want you to do? And he just took it off and said, just, just be content. Throughout the next few days, I was yielding, yielding to that word from the Lord, uh, the application of this scripture. There were other things that the Lord was, was reminding me of. R- reminding me of a passage that I actually, I, if I remember right, I, I preached it here um, uh, not long ago from 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we could take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we'll be content. But those who desire to be rich Fall into temptation. Remember, I, I said this is, a, this is about your soul. And this is why I'm sharing this with you and sharing my personal experience because it, it's related to your soul. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money Not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. I don't want to do anything that would cause me to wander away from the faith. You to wander away from the faith. Pierce myself. Pierce you. Pierce my family. Paul goes on instructing Timothy in the final verses of, the, of that chapter. He says, as for the rich, so again, don't, don't, don't hear me say that possessions are bad. They're not. They're tools in which you are stewards. You get that, I hope. Please don't hear me say that possessions are bad. You are stewards of, of what God has given you. But there is a response in being, uh, being stewards here. As for the rich in this age, chapter 6, verse 17, 1 Timothy, charge them not to be haughty or set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up, them, uh, storing up treasure 
for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Not now, but a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. This runs parallel to what the author of Hebrews was talking about when he kept looking at these individuals of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and pointing them or uh, pointing at them and saying look at them for they were looking forward to a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. That they're looking at it in such a way that the writer of Hebrews is saying, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. L looking at it in such a way in the future that some were tortured, refusing, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. And I read, I read these verses and I, and, I, and I wrestle with that whole issue of contentment because I am constantly bombarded with this is what this life looks like and this is what this life looks like in Colorado. And, and so I'm really bringing this up in our context and our culture here because whether or not you realize it, we live in an incredible city and there is so much to do here. I love, again, I, I love to ski, I love to hunt, I love to fish, I love to golf, I love to hike, I love to go to our parks. I love our Rockies. Finally converted from a Braves fan from years ago. I, I love doing these things. But the reality is, is that those are so, everything I just listed there, along with what you're listing in your own mind right now, are temporal and have nothing to do with the foundation for the future. And, and, and so I, I get to this passage and I, and, and I, and I, and I, I'm, I have to keep evaluating. I literally, I literally wrote this. And don't, I don't say this to alarm you. I'm not looking to move. I love living here. And I pray that the Lord leaves me here for an extended, extended time. But when I, when, when I, when I read that these people in chapter 11 of Hebrews made it clear that they were seeking a homeland, that they, sought a de they desired a better country that is a heavenly one, a, a country where God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them the city. And he's look they're looking at this from afar, knowing that it's coming. They're being patient enough to wait on it. Being patient enough to, to, to say, I, I, I'm, going to, I, I'm going to wait because I know that there's, there's future blessings of a city where God is, there, is our God and he's prepared it. It's nothing that I've done in and of myself. And, so in the, and, and again, I don't say this to alarm you, but I wrote in my margin here, as much as I love, Living in Colorado, this world is not my home. Amen. And I will tell you, it was painful to write that. It was painful from a sense that if you, if you, if you really want to know how much I love living here and love being with you and the, the people of our state and our, this, this, this culture here that we're in, I, I loved it so much that when I was in the fifth grade, my mom showed this to me uh, a couple of months ago. She pulled out one of my old journals where I had written, I can't wait to live in Colorado. <laughs> Go figure. Again, as much as I love living here, as much as I love everything that's going on around me right now, this is not my home. And so I have to keep asking myself the question, am I going to be content with what I have? Can I be, can, can I be content in a city that has so much going on and so much going for it and enjoy it but not to not have to 
chase the Joneses and, you, and, 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 and chase something that is wasting away? Can I, can I live in a city much like what I was saying for the, for the purpose of, of Acts 17, that God has put me here and I have to remind myself here, God, is not, God has not put us here, God has not put me here for, for the, the fleeting passing of this world. God has put me here according to Acts 17. He designed it. So I would be salt and light to those who are around me. And I just encourage you, don't, don't miss how the writer of Hebrews is calling you and calling me to contentment. I've I'll, I'll, I got to share, you can go back and read James 5, 1 through 6 at some point in time, but I do need to read this to you because I was, I was, I was pierced this week when I, when I read this. Uh, it, it's, a, it's another, uh, excuse me, another... Uh, passage the Lord just is using to shape my heart. Ezekiel 16. Write this down. Go back and read it. Meditate on it. As you're asking yourself the question about your contentment, Ezekiel 16, 48 through 50. As I live, declares the Lord, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of of your sister Sodom. Now, when we hear Sodom, we think one thing. But I need, you to, I need you to hear this. She, speaking of Sodom, and her daughters had pride. Excess of food and prosperous ease. But did not aid the poor and the needy. And I read that, and I'm like, oh, Lord, help me. I was telling my buddy Dave here several weeks ago. He'll probably remember it. I, I said, man, I got a good life. I got a good life. And I do. I've got a good life. But when I evaluate that against the backdrop of what I just shared and the backdrop of that scripture... Ooh, I've got to be really careful. It's about my soul. It's about your soul. I, I, I don't want to do anything in this life that would cause God to say, well, that was an abomination. You, you, you had it all. You lived in ease. But you neglected the poor and the needy. Let me, I'm going to pull a Pastor Tony here. I, I, uh, I like when he does it because he, he's, it's almost as if he's, he's getting really real with us in the end. How do you fight this? How do you, how do you fight this day in and day out? How do you, how do you, uh, how, how do you live in such a way? Um, <laughs> spit a cough drop on my Bible. Dr. Grubbs, I'm going to need a prescription, please. <laughs> How do you fight this? Verse 15. <laughs> through him, then. Through him, then. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. It's real simple. I wish I had time to break down the entirety of the rest of this chapter. I don't, but I close with this. If you're going to fight this battle, if you're going to fight this battle of faith, if you're going to keep exercising your faith, it all begins with that heart of thanksgiving to the Lord, a sacrifice of praise that acknowledge with your lips His name, His renown, His glory. Because when you put your focus on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith, of my faith, 
it takes a lot of weight off. Because, yes, faith without works is dead. But the reality is, is that God is cultivating that faith in you and that faith in me on a day in and day out basis. I would implore you, I would encourage you, do that. Set your eyes on him. Don't try to do this on your own. You can't do it. I mean, Jesus, Jesus is authoring it, he's perfecting it. Let him do the work in you. And even as you're asking yourself these questions, even as I'm asking these, self, these questions of myself, I realize, I realize that, yeah, because the Holy Spirit has made these things clear to me and I'm holding my life up to the mirror of Scripture, that changes I have to keep making. I have to keep fighting this battle. But the reality is, is that God has made it very clear what He expects of me, what He's asking me to do. He's asking, he, he's asking us these things. There's a whole other list of imperatives there. I encourage you in your, in your free time uh, over this week. Uh, make that part of, your, uh, part of your personal Bible study. Look at the commands of Scripture. Look at what the author of, of Hebrews is continuing to ask you and me to do. Because again, these are responses. The way we should live. The way we should live out our faith before each other. Father, um, I'm very grateful for for this time. And I thank you for what you're teaching me. God, I got so far to go. But Lord, I, I thank you that you, you're perfecting my faith. It's not Jason perfecting my faith. Oh yes, Lord, you're, you're asking me to do certain things and I have to trust you. There, there, there are risks that I have to take and, and, and even of these five, just, just these five, there are decisions that I have to make that, that uh, ultimately have an unknown unknown end if I process it in the flesh. But Lord, if I process these things by your spirit and by your word, I know that you're working out something good for me. You're allowing me to make deposits in a future foundation. A future foundation to which I will ultimately come. Lord, help me to remember this world is not my home. It's not my home for my brothers and sisters here. This is not my home for me. Help me to set my eyes. Help me to set my eyes on that, on that place, uh, that, that future place, that, that place we all, we all see from afar. And Lord, help us to acknowledge that ultimately we are strangers and exiles on this earth. In Christ's name, amen.